I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, Israel and the Palestinians are once again engaged in peace negotiations. And a number of legitimate questions are being raised in the Jewish community, not the least of which is, do these peace talks have any chance of being successful? Well, for some insight, I'm so pleased to be joined by one of the most outstanding analysts of Middle East affairs in the world, Robert Satloff, the brilliant executive director of the prestigious Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And Robert, thank you so much for joining us on Shalom TV. Well, thank you. It's very kind of you. So, Robert, first of all, people are asking, why now? What happened? What changed to somehow kickstart the Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations, which have been on hold for so long? Well, it's a good question. I think um, quite a few things changed. Um, in uh, the big picture, uh, President Obama approached the first year of his second term in office very differently than he approached the first year of his first term. Um, if you go back in time, you'll remember that um, from his second day um, as president, he said that uh, um, Middle East peace was a top priority, and he was appointing George Mitchell as his envoy, and he he believed that um, an Israeli settlement freeze was the key to unlocking this diplomacy. Well, that sent off diplomacy in a, in a, in a direction where it was going to run up against a, a brick wall very quickly. Um, U.S.-Israeli relations um, hit a tailspin, and uh, there was almost no negotiations throughout the entire first term of the Obama administration. In his second term, the president had a very different approach. Um, not settlements first. As a matter of fact, he, he went to Israel, something he didn't do in his first term at all, and he um, embraced Israel, embraced Zionism, embraced the Jewish people's connection to uh, the land, um, and went to Ramallah to say in front of cameras that uh, um, he had dropped this condition about settlement uh, freeze. And uh, it was just a totally different approach. Uh, and then the second major change is there's a Secretary of State uh, John Kerry, um, today, who, unlike Hillary Clinton, um, embraced the idea that peace talks um, would be his own personal priority, not for an envoy, not for another level diplomat, but would be the, um, something owned by the Secretary of State. Some may say that um, this is a misallocation of American attention and American priorities, but John Kerry believes that, that uh, it's a top priority and that only he can do it. And I think the combination of the president's shift in um, strategy toward Israel and John Kerry's embrace of personal responsibility were two key factors that made negotiations uh, uh, much more possible today than they were throughout the president's first term. That's fascinating, Robert. And what interests me is you did not say there were any changes in either the Palestinian position or the Israeli position, that the context in terms of America has changed. But one of the yes. things that we all are worried about is if there is an intransigence on the side of the Palestinians, and if they feel the Israelis are not offering enough, is there any chance now that there could be some kind of movement forward on a comprehensive peace? And if I'm right, Robert, I believe that John Kerry wants this to occur within nine months, which most people are saying is wildly unrealistic. But I was curious as to whether you feel there's been any movement within the Middle East on either side, Israeli or Palestinian, that would make you, and you've been very, you know, kind of hard-nosed and realistic about the possibilities and lack of possibilities about peace going forward. Has anything changed on the ground for you in Israel or within the Palestinian Authority that makes you think this is the time for negotiations to go forward? Um, when, when American political leaders, including the Secretary of State, uh, say that they believe that time is running out for the two-state solution, I don't think that's an analytical comment because there's really no objective rationale while that's the case. I think it reflects more their own uh, political assessment of what the traffic will bear here, not what, um, what uh, uh, the diplomatic will, traffic will bear overseas. In terms of your question, the other major change 
that has occurred in the region um, is uh, the various implications of um, you know what is euphemistically called the Arab Spring, um, you know, fundamental uh, change in Egypt and Syria, um, uh, beyond in the Middle East, tremors felt in Jordan and elsewhere, um, and this has gone in both directions. I mean, on the one hand, uh, it, uh, it makes Israelis feel far more nervous about their regional situation, which lowers the possibility of, uh, uh, of diplomatic concession. But on the other hand, um, uh, Hamas has been weakened as a result of the events, um, the recent events. It has lost first its patron in Syria, and more recently its Muslim Brotherhood patron in Egypt. Um, so Hamas is weakened. Um, uh, Abbas, surprisingly, um, uh, you know, though he runs a very weak Palestinian authority, um, it has proven more resilient than Hosni Mubarak and Bashar al-Assad and, and regimes throughout the Middle East. So in a certain sense, you know, that weak man is, is, still, is still there, still, mm -hmm. still holding fast. Um, uh, so the, cha the regional change has cut both ways. Um, you know, is the circumstance right for an agreement? I can't say that's the case. But the circumstance is right for a negotiation. Okay. And uh, there, is a, there, is, there is a difference between the two. Yes. You need a negotiation before you go to reach an agreement. Okay. And I think both Abbas and Netanyahu believe it's in their interest to be talking with each other rather than to be fighting at the U.N. or some other place. Okay. So go through some of the specific issues with me. First of all, how do you feel about this prisoner exchange Exchange is the wrong word. This prisoner release, Israel has released 26 prisoners just as these talks begin. They're promising to basically release 1,000 prisoners or so. It has created enormous controversy within the Israeli, among the Israeli people. And there's something I don't understand, Robert, and maybe you can clarify it for us. What did the Palestinians give to Israel in return for Israel's release of those prisoners? Well, um, I believe it's just over 100 prisoners, uh, all told, not, not 1,000. And uh, my understanding is that uh, um, prisoners will be released um, in sort of drips and drabs over the course of the planned nine months of these negotiations. Um, uh, and I think there's really two answers to your question. You know, what did the Palestinians give? My sense is that the Palestinians, uh, to the extent that they gave anything, they gave a commitment to um, uh, to maintaining in main, to staying in negotiations constructively rather than going outside negotiations to the UN or elsewhere um, um, to carry on a diplomatic battle against Israel rather than a negotiation with Israel. Um, I don't think that's the only benefit, however, that uh, Israeli decision makers determined was important enough. To, um, uh, to merit the release of these prisoners. I think also a, um, uh, one cannot overlook the factor of Iran. Um, uh, not that Iran is, is part of these negotiations, but um, I think uh, indirectly the Israelis recognize the benefit of having an improved international environment for the next nine months, um, uh, an, an improved environment um, that provides the context for a possible decision on military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. Not that any such decision has been made, but that Israel at least knows that it will have a bit more of a sympathetic international environment in which to make that decision than one in which it is fighting with the Palestinians of the United Nations. I'm sorry, um, are, are you saying, Robert, that Israel has somehow obtained a better public relations outside the region, in, within the European Union, in America? by allowing murderers to go free? Well, um, uh, for sure. Um, uh, yes. Um, and here, uh, you know, I'm, uh, here I look at the actions of members of Netanyahu's cabinet that are um, more hawkish than he is on, um, on certain national security issues, especially Palestinian-related issues, but yet who supported the uh, prisoner release um, deal, and specifically um, Minister of Defense Bogi Yaalon. And there, 
I think that um, uh, my interpretation, I don't have this firsthand, my interpretation is that um, it was the improvement in the overall strategic environment that benefits Israel that made it um, worthwhile to do early release for these prisoners. Um, uh, I also think, and again, this is assessment, not, uh, not firsthand knowledge, that, um, uh, uh, that if the Shin Bet had any reason to, to, to fear specific return of, the, of any individual prisoner to their terrorist ways, um, uh, they, would, they almost surely would not have been released. Um, uh, you're, suggest, you're suggesting that Israel's, Israel has a certain degree of confidence that the 120 some odd, um, the, uh, some of them, Robert, are vicious murderers, go on a bus and just stab civilian Israelis to death, that you're saying to me that Israel has a high degree of confidence that the 120 murderers that they're letting go will not repeat some form of terrorist, murderous attack against Israelis in the future. And that's my understanding, is that, is that they have a high degree of confidence that, uh, um, you know, that uh, these people who performed their crimes between 20 and 30 years ago um, will not be uh, uh, returning to their, uh, their terrorist ways. Now, of course, high degree of confidence is not certainty, but, uh, but I think there is a reason why these prisoners were chosen for release and not, and not, uh, not other prisoners. Okay. Look, you bring such, a, such, such more of a sophisticated view to how international negotiations, especially between parties like Israel and the Palestinians, occur, the context, that I feel a little bit, I don't know, I, I feel somewhat naive and therefore, I don't want to suggest that my position here has any weight. I'm only now going to express to you what I hear other Jews saying, that here you have two parties that have been unable to sit down and talk to each other. The fact that both parties now are willing to sit with each other should be in and of itself enough reason for each party to be willing to sit, that there should not have been a price necessary to bring Israel to the table. And again, the price you describe the Palestinians paying is somewhat nebulous at best. And at the same time, there are some people in Israel and out who are absolutely outraged, Robert, that Israel was forced to allow wanton murderers to go free. And I'm surprised in some way that the Western world, the Obama administration, the European Union, is not outraged that the Palestinians would make the release of brutal murderers a condition for the resumption of peace negotiations. And then I say to you, but I, you know, my point is made with humility. I want you to explain to our audience why what I've just expressed may, simple, may be too simplistic. Well, Clearly, emotions are running very, very strong about this, and, and, and understandably so. Um, uh, it's not as though I have a particular dog in this fight, as Jim Baker might have said. Um, I'm just trying to understand why this Israeli government might have voted overwhelmingly um, by a large majority of the cabinet to endorse this approach. Mm -hmm. And I look quite closely at people um, who deserve uh, respect for their, uh, for their realism on, on foreign policy issues, like Minister of Defense Bogey alone, and I can only interpret their support for this um, as a um, the product of a cost-benefit analysis about what Israel derives from this. Um, and I believe that their assessment is um, not just that Israel gets certain things from the Palestinians, um, certain ephemeral things, um, important though they may be, but that also Israel gets uh, larger benefit in terms of its relations. Uh, um, with uh, the international community, the United States, the, U the UN, elsewhere. Um, and that, that judgment had been made that the risk um, was worth uh, taking. Uh, okay. Uh, otherwise, I think we would have been, we'd been reading leak after leak after leak from this or that Shin Bet and Mossad officer um, uh, uh, fretting about uh, the release of these prisoners, which we're not seeing. Okay. Let's move on then to some other issues. Do you think there is any possibility that there 
could be now an agreement worked out about the city of Jerusalem and the Palestinian claim and desire for East Jerusalem to be the uh, capital of the new Palestinian state. Do you see movement on either side as something that would be realistic? Either the Palestinians would give up the claim or the state of Israel would accept the claim. Uh, in the current environment, I do not see a resolution to the Jerusalem uh, dispute between the Okay, I think you're right. What about the Palestinian right of return? Do you see either the Palestinians giving up that right, or do you see Israel accepting a significant right of Palestinian return? Um, in, uh, in terms of the right of return, this I do see as, um, as one where I can imagine a, um, uh, a significant uh, compromise um, uh, in the sense that um, um, I can imagine um, the Palestinians giving up their effective right of return mm -hmm. um, and the Israelis increasing the, you know, by some small number, the number of family reunifications that are currently allowed and um, each side um, uh, claiming a sort of victory in this. I don't think that, that the right of return is itself the uh, the major stumbling block to an okay. agreement. Um, I do think that there are that there is considerable distance on some of the other issues. Which other fact, issues? Some issues like security. Yes. People think are are fairly simple to resolve. But I think they've gotten even more difficult to resolve by events in the last couple of years. What about demilitarization? Do you think the Palestinians? Well, that's, that's my point. I think I think issues relating to security are more difficult now. Um, the events of uh, of the last two years underscore the fragility of various Arab regimes. And so the Israelis are going to demand an even deeper and more intrusive um, security presence uh, along the Jordan River and uh, perhaps in other um, arenas, uh, electromagnetic, aerial, um, uh, these sorts of things. And the Palestinians, for their part, have gotten more demanding in what they're looking for in terms of security. So, uh, um, you know, the, for some, I know some people argue that uh, security is one of the easier things to negotiate. I think it's become one of the more difficult. Fascinating. Things to negotiate. Okay. Secretary of State Kerry said during his visit to Bogota, Colombia, just earlier this week, that the United States of America now views all the settlements, the Israeli settlements, as illegitimate. To what extent at the moment is, first of all, is that statement in your mind consistent with prior administrations? The, to the best of my ability, except for the Carter administration, the United States government has not taken the view that settlements are illegal. And Kerry did not use the word illegal, but he called them illegitimate. At the same time, he thought that he indicated that the settlement issue should be resolved uh, within negotiations. But to what extent do you feel, Robert, that the settlement problem is an obstacle that cannot be uh, resolved? Well, um, I don't think that the, uh, that the settlements are the obstacle to uh, the resolution of this conflict. And um, um, I never thought so, and, and, I don't, and I think the position of the U.S. administration at the moment is that it doesn't believe it's the obstacle either. Um, not that it's the most welcome thing in the world, but I don't think it's used it as the obstacle. In fact, I think John Kerry went on to note that, um, if I remember correctly, in his statement, that the announcement of new settlement activity was, was um, um, uh, predominantly restricted to territory that uh, almost surely would be retained by Israel under any peace agreement. And therefore, um, the goal was, is, merely, is, is more urgently to define the... Um, the line of a future border, which would um, uh, immediately um, resolve the settlement problem, because if it's you know the, the new settlements will be inside Israel's new line. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, um, I don't think the settlements are the issue. I think a far more significant issue is the, is the more fundamental issue of, uh, of recognition of uh, not just two states, but two states for two peoples, mm -hmm. um, and the full. Palestinian recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Um, uh, How important is it to you, Robert, that the Palestinian Authority recognize Israel not only as a state that may exist, but as a Jewish state? 
Um, well, I think that uh, uh, in the in a final agreement, um, uh, I think that is that is very important because what, that that's the uh, you know that's the flip side of the resolution of the right of return. Yes, which is um, uh, um, you know the traditional American position, which I think on this point is quite correct. Is Palestinians have a right to return to the future state of Palestine? They don't have a right to return to two states, both the state of Palestine and the state of Israel. Um, that would be uh, um, you know preposterous on, on the face of it. Um, uh, and if indeed that's the effective outcome. Then, um, then I think that is a huge step toward um, a true resolution of this conflict. Okay. Can the Palestinian Authority make an agreement with Israel that does not include Gaza? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, um, certainly the Palestinian Authority today does not control Gaza um, and has no operational plans to regain control of Gaza. Um, 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 if, however, Israel and the Palestinian Authority reach an agreement, um, it will be the template of, of what an agreement will be. It doesn't necessarily mean it will be implemented tomorrow, um, but um, uh, uh, I think the, uh, the, the, you know, the PA does carry with it the historical legacy of the Palestinian national movement. And while it can't implement its agreement and, and enforce it over Gaza, um, it would be a huge step if the Palestinian um, national movement and Israel reached a uh, final resolution of their conflict. Um, and so it doesn't bring the conflict to, you know, to its end, but it certainly would be a, uh, um, uh, you know, a huge leap towards okay. that. So, so, so it's definitely as, worth continuing to do. Okay, so as we wrap up, as you now look at the process that really is just beginning now, Robert, what degree of six, on a scale of one to ten, how optimistic or pessimistic are you? What, ex, what chance do you think there is that there will be some serious agreement reached as a result of the process that is now unfolding? <laughs> uh, that, that's, you know, that's a difficult question to answer. I'm, I'm a strategic optimist about the eventual resolution of this conflict. Um, you know, the two-state solution has been the, um, the one consistent um, negotiating options since 1937. Um, uh, there's lots of other ideas that have been out there, and they've come and they've gone. I do think that eventually uh, the parties will um, repartition the land of Palestine to accommodate um, the Jewish state of Israel and, uh, and a Palestinian entity. Um, whether it happens in the next nine months, I think, you know, the, the, well, you know no betting man would, would bet anything significant on that. But I think in the long run, it, it, it almost surely will happen. I hope you're right, and I love talking to you. I love your insight. I wish you, as we are about to start the new Jewish year, a sweet, healthy, wonderful year. Shana Tova Mituka. And I hope we get to talk often, Robert. Thank you very much. And best to you and to uh, your listeners and viewers. Thank you so much. The thoughts of Robert Satloff, Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I hope you enjoyed hearing his take on the peace negotiations now going on between Israel and Palestinians. Um, and again, you've heard my own feelings. I, I, on the one hand, really would love to see Israel and the Palestinians come to some kind of re you know, workable, reasonable, realistic solution that would create a two-state solution. Uh, you've heard me say many times on Shalom TV, I'm, in the, I'm, a, I'm among those who really believe that the two-state solution is what the Jewish people have always been willing to agree to, back starting in the 1930s, when partition was first suggested by Great Britain. The State of Israel was built on a principle of sharing the land, not because the Jew is giving up his claim to the land, Sometime in the far, far distant future, it would be wonderful if all of biblical Eretz Yisrael were part of the Jewish state. But in the realpolitik of today, the Jew has said, we will share this land. There are two peoples in this land, both of whom feel very strongly about their claim to the land. And so the best thing to do, the fairest thing to do, not for any pragmatic reason, the fairest thing to do is to share the land. And I believe that 
the narrative, the narrative of the Middle East has been one group of people and one national entity has said consistently, we will share the land. And one national entity, one people, has said, no, we want it all. And for me, while I hope very, very much that the peace negotiations move forward in a positive way, I am very, very, very skeptical. And when I hear you know, people like Robert Satloff say, well, Jerusalem, there's no way to compromise there. Security, I don't see any compromise there. I don't know what we're doing here. And I believe we should try, by the way. We're trying. That's what the Jew does. We strive always for peace with our neighbors and within our own community. But I don't understand what's changed. And I don't feel Robert Satloff has identified what's changed on the ground within the Palestinian Authority or, for that matter, within the state of Israel. Israel has always said, live with us in peace and we'll live with you in peace. You can have a land. Short of that, there's nothing we can do. And I also feel very strongly that you don't let butchers, cruel, the most inhumane murderers go in order to get the other side to sit with you. And I don't hear a real quid, a quid pro quo. And Robert Sitloff is right. If this is what the state of Israel wants to do, then we will support them. But I still don't understand it. Those are my thoughts. And as always, love to know yours. And if you get a chance, be in touch with me, email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I'd love to hear from you. My thanks to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, to our producer for this segment of In the News, Alan Ulrich. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.